Lost without hope, with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace, so free, washes over have made me new now life begins with you released from my chains i'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully he canceled my debt is over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins welcome you to our Good Friday service online. Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sin. The Apostle Paul in the second Corinthians, he wrote that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so wherever you are, wherever you might be watching this, whatever your circumstance might be, we invite you to look to the cross to focus your heart and your mind on Christ Jesus today as we reflect on the cross and look to him as our source of hope and strength. Let's continue to worship and praise him together.
ransom from heaven Jesus Messiah Lord of all Sing all our hope All our hope is in you
So they took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And again another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had earlier come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. 
Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. I love a good story. I love to hear a good story. I love to learn how to tell a good story. And I imagine the online movie industry right now is just booming, as well as book rental or book purchases online. Why is that? Well, I believe it's because we all love a good story. And when we have some downtime or we feel like our stress levels, our anxiety levels are beginning to rise, a good story whisks us away into a world that is so different than what we're experiencing here. It temporarily takes us out of some of our challenges. Well, as you may know, a good story has character development. It has plot development. It sets up the background and the context so that when you get to the climax of the story, you know, you understand why this moment is so critical. I love the, the suspense, even the despair, the, the risk that all may be lost. Well, we are in the midst of a series in the book of John, following Jesus on his road to the cross. And you can read for yourselves how throughout his life and ministry, as historically recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus taught on the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom where he reigns, where God's rule of justice and mercy and order and peace are the expectation, not the exception. But if you do the reading, you'll also notice that those closest to Jesus were actually hearing Jesus say that his kingdom was going to be set up while they were in this earth. Well, it was in their lifetime. They longed for the fierce leadership of Jesus where he would kick out the Roman occupation and I believe they also longed for the tranquil, tranquil leadership of Jesus on the throne. But a couple weeks ago, if you recall, we followed Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane and we watched as the, this large battalion of soldiers arrested him. Can you imagine with me the despair of Jesus' followers? that they must have experienced on that night. I mean, his disciples flee. They scatter to who knows where. I imagine them distraught. What, what just happened? How can this be? He was, he was supposed to set up his kingdom. He's going to rule. But now they arrested him, and, and Jesus just kind of let that happen? What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to me? They are left in the suspense of this coming tragedy. Will their greatest fears come true? From our angle, we have these historical records that we can track with, but for them, they were living this real time. We then listened on, listened in on the bogus religious and the civil trials that were more about politics and selfish ambition than they ever were about innocence or guilt. And early on the Friday morning, somehow word reaches all the disciples that Jesus was bogusly tried, wrongfully committed, convicted, and now he is condemned to die on a cross, all in one night, which, by the way, was illegal in Jewish law. But what it is what it is. It's all going down now. I can only imagine their dashed hopes, their despair, their hopelessness. Well, we pick up the events in John chapter 19, verses 17 to 42. And if you missed the reading earlier in the service, I'd encourage you to maybe push pause and go read these events for yourselves now. Once convicted and beaten mercilessly, almost to the point of death, verse 17 says that the soldiers take charge of Jesus and lead him away, and that he is carrying his own cross. It is standard Roman procedure for the condemned prisoner to carry the cross piece on their shoulders through the streets of Jerusalem. The very sight of a beaten, bleeding, and terrified prisoner carrying part of his own execution was to impress upon everybody who saw him, and maybe especially the youth and the children, that crime does not pay. But the ironic part is, is that Jesus did nothing wrong. Yet he was bruised, he was beaten, he was whipped. He had this crown of thorns thrust onto his head. And here he is, carrying his own cross piece. 
He is led through the streets for all to see. It would have been like a parade with both, with both sides of the streets lined with people. Here is Almighty God, creator of all that exists, being treated in this way. Can you imagine the humiliation? Can you imagine the burning as the hot sun causes a mixture of Jesus' sweat and blood to run down the forehead and into his eyes? Pilate has an inscription prepared and fastened to the cross. Why is that? Well, what's happening here is it was customary that as the criminal was led through the streets to be crucified, there would be a man preceding him carrying a placard. And on this placard would be written the crime for which the condemned man was to be executed. Once crucified, it would then be affixed to the, to the cross above the man's head. But since Jesus was innocent, there was no crime to write on this placard. So Pilate decides to give a parting shot to the religious leaders. Perhaps it was in revenge for blackmailing him into ordering Jesus' death in the first place. We don't know. But Pilate simply writes, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And he writes it in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. Those are the three primary languages in that region at that time. But if you remember in the reading, the Jewish, religion, the, the Jewish leaders were upset that he had done this. Why? Well, for a number of reasons. One was that for their king to come from Nazareth was preposterous. Nazareth was the hick town that nobody wanted to be from. Even Nathaniel, the Apostle Philip's friend, who when he met Jesus and then heard that he was from Nazareth, kind of went under his breath, well, can anything good come from Nazareth? That the Jews' king would come from a place like that was the worst of all insults. And yet, on the surface, it was the way Pilate could get a dig at the chief priests. But on a much more profound level, it was actually proclaiming truth. Jesus is the King of the Jews. And much more than that, He is King of kings and He is Lord of lords. Revelation 19. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 reads this way. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, the soldiers lead Jesus to a hill outside the city where people are executed by hanging on a cross. And at the time, it is, uh, they call it the place of the skull. In Aramaic, it is called Golgotha. And in Latin, Calvary. Crucifixion was the most horrible, shameful form of execution. And the Romans had perfected this art of proclaim, uh, prolonging a victim's agony as he was slowly tortured to death. Most hung on their crosses for days before they died, before succumbing to exhaustion or dehydration or shock or shock or suffocation because they could no longer raise themselves up on their legs to get a breath. But I find it interesting that John doesn't spend much time on the excruciating details of his suffering of his beating as in his whipping, not even on the details of his crucifixion. He simply writes in verse 18, he says, there they crucified him. Instead, John focuses on other significant events that often are not covered by the other gospels. And John makes this transition. He starts this transition with the word but. It's almost like John takes the camera off these callous, the callous indifference of the soldiers as they are dividing up his clothes literally in front of him. He takes it off the, the crowds that are mocking him and gawking at him as he is hanging there in pain and disgrace. And he says, but, verse 25, he says, but standing by were a small group of followers, of Jesus' followers. Consider the despair that they are feeling. Their hope is gone. How could it all end this way? In verse 26, it says, When Jesus saw his mother standing there with the disciple that he loved. Now, among this small group were Jesus, were, were 
Jesus' mother, and John, the apostle who wrote our text today. Now let me stop here for a moment. I've often wondered why John never mentions his name when he refers to himself as he writes, but he always calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Why is that? Doesn't Jesus love everybody? Is this John's quiet way of putting himself above others because really I'm the only one that matters anyway? Initially, I thought it looked that way, but on deeper reflection, it's none of that. Think of it this way. If I said to you, all of you who are sitting on your couch or listening on podcasts someplace, that I love you, that would be a true statement. I care about you spiritually. I care about how you're doing emotionally and relationally I care, and, and physically. I care about how you're doing. With the love that God has placed in my heart for me and for you, I, I, I care about how you're doing. I accept you for who you are. I love you. Now, if Lorianne, who is my wife and will be sitting beside me watching this, and, and, and he, when she hears me say, I love you to all of you, if you were to watch her expression, the expression on her face, it would probably be nothing, no reaction. But if I lean over to her on the couch and I whisper in her ear, I love you, and maybe a few other things, well, her face will light up. Or she'll have this contented, peaceful look on her face. Why the difference? Why wouldn't she react at all when I say I love you to all of you, to this whole group of people that I'm speaking to, but when I lean over to her personally and say I love you, it's the same words, she lights up. I believe it's because I have a relationship with her that I don't have with any of you or anyone else. My relationship with Lorianne is unique among all other relationships that I have. And it's the same between John and Jesus. I think John is simply describing a relationship that he has with Jesus that the other disciples don't. They don't experience. And as far as we can see from our text, there are no other disciples that are standing near Jesus like this, only John. John places himself right beside Jesus' dear mother. Talk about a guy who knows what will be important to Jesus at a time like this, these crucial moments of such deep pain. Well, how did Jesus, how did John know this? I think it's because John drew close to Jesus. And in Hebrews, another place in Scripture, it says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. And I believe it's, the, it's, the, it's true for all of us. Each of us can have a relationship with Jesus that is unique and it's meaningful. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And the amount of time and energy that we, that we put into it, that we invest in this relationship with God, will determine our experience in it. The health, the intimacy that we experience in it. And the proof that of John's close relationship with Jesus? Well, it's in verse 26. It says this, When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, his, this disciple took her into his home. Evidently, Joseph, who was Jesus' earthly father, was already passed away. He was already dead. Jesus, as the oldest son, didn't commit his mother now into the hands of his half-brothers who didn't even believe who he was and wouldn't, wouldn't believe that until well after the resurrection. He entrusts her to John, the person that Jesus has the closest relationship with. So what's so important? that John includes, John records this brief interaction. Well, it demonstrates, it demonstrates the beauty of Jesus' love and compassion for his widowed mother in the midst of his excruciating pain. Jesus isn't yelling at the, at the soldiers for the cruelty. He isn't cursing the, the religious leaders who put him there and con falsely convicted him. He's not even feeling sorry for himself and whimpering in the pain and the embarrassment of here he is hanging here mostly naked. He's not thinking about himself at all. 
He's thinking about the woman who bore him, the woman who helped raise him and the pain that she must be going through right now. Her firstborn son, who was supposed to be king, who was supposed to reign, is going to set up his kingdom and was going to rule the world. I'm not a mother, but I can only imagine how her heart was breaking. Remember, Jesus came to give us a tangible picture of who God is. God is not an angry man who we should cower from or who we should want to hide from in, in, in fear of a scornful look or a beating that he's going to give us next. This is a God who in some of the greatest pain possible is still concerned about how we're doing. That we're cared for tenderly. That we sense his presence, that we, that we feel his embrace. John entrusts his precious mother to his most trustworthy friend, John. Well, I love God. I love God more than anything in this world. And my relationship with him is unique, it is personal, and it is profoundly meaningful. And as as close a relationship that I have with him, I know that others seem to know him more, seem to have a closer or a different kind of relationship with him. Do I compare my relationship with God with their relationship with God? Well, well no, that's, that's them. I can only pursue God within who I am, within the bounds of who I am. Questions that I need to ask myself are questions like, am I actually pursuing a relationship with him? Am I investing in this relationship? If I'm not, how can I expect it to be meaningful? How can I expect it to be fulfilling? Another question is, am I pursuing him in ways that honor the scriptures and what the scriptures teach? For example, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, Am I seeking this relationship and pursuing this relationship with God through Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ lays it out in the Word? Other questions would include, am I opening myself up to God and what's really going on inside, or am I just crying out to Him, coming to Him in, in crisis, or just simply always just giving Him lists of my needs? Am I stopping to hear Him speak to me? Am I paying attention? Is my spirit quiet enough to pay attention to a flow of thoughts and pictures or scripture? Perhaps it's a memory that he's using to speak to me so that this is a two-way conversation. It's a two-way relationship. That's what God wants. That's what's available. And John demonstrates it for us here. John had a unique relationship with God that appears to be different than, than the others. Pretty cool but so can we. You know, again, it appears John's priority is not Jesus' physical suffering, which was significant, but it was the picture of God that Jesus is representing here as he's going through this unbelievable plan to save the world, this unbelievable journey to save the world from it, their sin. And in case you don't understand the significance of sin and why it was... It, it, it was necessary, it required Jesus to be treated in this way. Let me just take a few moments. God dwells in perfect holiness. There is no blemish, there is no evil, there is no uh, mistreatment, there's no suffering. God reigns as ultimate supreme, ruler supreme, in perfection. No one is, is his equal. No one comes even close to his majesty or his glory. And everything that falls short of God's perfection is sin. Scripture calls it sin. Sin is the corruption of a being through acts that defy God. Sin is a thought. It's a word. It's an action that is considered immoral, selfish or shameful, perhaps harmful, uh, alienating from God's perspective. As people... We were made in the image of God. We, originally, we reflected His character. We reflected His heart. But when we rebelled against God, and you can recall that history from Adam and Eve, imperfection and brokenness, Scripture calls sin, came into the world. 
And every person sin since has walked in sin. Doesn't matter how good we are. Doesn't matter how bad we've been. All of us now fall short of God's glory. There is no possible way that we can measure up. And the penalty of this rebellion, this corruption from God's perfection is death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. This is when death comes not only to our physical bodies, but it also comes to us spiritually. As our own spirit is dead to God, it's separated. We, we can't connect with Him. We can't know Him. And written somewhere deep into the code at, at the creation of the world is this principle that the shedding of blood resulting in death is the only way that this, pay, that this penalty is paid. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says this, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now God in His mercy allowed people early on to sacrifice an animal in order to cover over their sin. They had to sacrifice on a regular basis because people continued to sin and that sacrifice was never permanent. But Jesus, get this, Jesus came to be the sacrifice for us. Jesus is the sacrifice for us once for all. He came to shed his blood and to die in our place. So not only that we wouldn't have to die, but we can also connect with him directly. We can enter his throne room. You know, I believe that we've been created with a space in our lives that can only be filled by God. Deep inside, we long to connect with him, although we go looking in all these other places for it. Once our sin is removed, a.k.a. covered by Jesus' atoning sacrifice, when we confess and repent of it, we can enter into a relationship with God that was simply impossible any other way. He will come and He will fill that void. He will fill that space within us. And so, can you see? Can you see how Jesus' suffering here and His death is the climax of Jesus' human existence. It's the focal point of God's plan for our salvation. His plan to remove the barrier between us and God so that we can know Him personally and spend eternity with Him. This is the very reason why Jesus came. What Jesus knows and what we know because we can track with Him, but the disciples and His followers had not yet understood is that this is the very life purpose Jesus came to fulfill. He said, I've come to seek and save those who are lost. He says, I've come not for those who don't think they need a doctor, but for those who are sick and they know they need one. He says he's come for those to, to give life and to help us experience life as he intended to be, both while we live here in these, in these bodies on this earth, but also in the life to come. Not only were his disciples not picking up on this, but neither do they know that this is the road to Jesus accomplishing his purpose. It is the way that he would set up his kingdom. This is what it takes to do these things. There literally is no other way. The last words that come out of Jesus' mouth are, it is finished. His disciples are standing there in utter despair. This is ultimate tragedy. Their worst fears came true. This is the worst possible outcome. All is lost. Jesus is gone. Jesus is dead. And their hope drains away from inside them. But Jesus' last words... We're not the quiet, whimpering voice of defeat. It says in Mark 15 that Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Can you just hear it? It is finished as it echoes around the, the hillside. This was a cry to Jesus. It was a cry. It was a voice of triumph. 
This is the cry of victory. Jesus had made it. He accomplished what he had set out to do. And that is a good feeling. When most who were crucified last any number of days on a cross, Jesus lasted six hours. Six hours. And he dies. It says in verse 30, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. They didn't even have to break his legs to speed up the process. Instead, they pierced his side to prove that he was already dead. And then a couple of religious leaders in Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who had conversations with Jesus while he was still alive, they come, they take Jesus' body down, they wrap it in about 75 pounds of spices and they bury him in what appears to be Joseph's brand new nearby grave. Tomb. Some like to argue that Jesus didn't actually die. The proof is all there. Eyewitnesses of some 500 people, including Roman officials, including Jewish leaders, and John himself, as he writes. I don't know what despair you may be feeling. I don't know what hopelessness I don't know how discouraged, lost, or alone you may feel. But like Jesus dying, is it possible that God has a purpose in this? Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God. Our sin and our debt overcoming. Jesus. Here is our king, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now, we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. 
We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong, the blind can see, the lost are found. We had heard the stories of old, yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken, behold freedom rising, now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing, his plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday. things that Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. In fact, everything that he accomplished in his suffering and death is represented by the elements of communion, the bread and the wine or the cup. This table is significant. This, these elements, because they represent everything Jesus Christ uh, did on the cross, it is for those of us who have already surrendered our life to Christ, who have already chosen to repent of our sin or turn from our old way of living and turn towards Jesus Christ, towards God, to, to honor Him in these ways. If that's a decision that you've already made, then this, this is for you. This time is for you. If you haven't made that decision yet, can I encourage you to take these moments and to reflect and to consider what you will do with Jesus Christ? What role will He play in your life? Consider these things. If you haven't already gathered the elements from around your house to have communion, I encourage you to just pause the video now. You can run and get them. It can be bread. It can be crackers. Uh, it can be juice of any kind. There's nothing necessarily sacred about Welch's grape juice. Uh, it can be milk or even water if that's all you've got in your place. Uh, Jesus used wine. So push pause, go get those elements, and then we'll carry on. You know, for some of us, I know that we've got our kids with us. We're sitting as a family, uh, uh, listening and watching here. Have you had the conversation with your kids about communion? How significant this is. If you haven't, I would encourage you to have the conversation and then decide for yourselves whether it's appropriate for them to partake or not. Have they clearly made a decision to follow Jesus Christ? Can they articulate that to you? Do they understand what it means to repent of their sin, to turn from their sin, and choose to honor Jesus with the choices that they make and how they uh, treat the people around them. And then can they articulate what these elements, the bread and the cup, what they actually mean? I would encourage you, if you haven't had that conversation, just push pause again on the video, have the conversation, and then come back and join us. Jesus says that the bread represents his body that was given for us. It says in another place, it's by his stripes, it's his wounds, it's his, it's his beatings. By those things he took in his body, we actually receive healing. That's a good thing. Healing physically, healing emotionally, healing mentally, from mental illness. These things are available to us through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians 11, and he says this, he says, The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's pray together. Father God, I'm so thankful 
for the plan that you had at the very beginning of time to send Jesus. Jesus, you volunteered to come and to give yourself as a sacrifice for us. We are so grateful. Lord Jesus, I'm so grateful. I thank you for the healing that's available to us. And God, as we ask and we pour out our heart before you for the healing of whatever area we, we have, Lord Jesus, would you come? Because it's available in your body that was given. Would you come and bring healing to us? But Jesus, we're so thankful. We don't take your sacrifice lightly. We love you and we worship you now as we eat. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's eat together. Jesus says that the cup represents his blood that was shed for us. We've already read how it needed uh, the shedding of blood in order to forgive our sins. And so I am so grateful that Jesus shed his blood, that he gave his life in this way so that we could have, we can enter into the very throne room of God. We have access to God himself because of Jesus shed blood and the forgiveness of sin. It goes on, 1 Corinthians 11, says in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this everywhere, every, whenever, sorry, you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I'm so grateful that you shed your blood for our sin. Thank you that when we acknowledge the truth that we have sinned, that we fall short of your glory, that you come and you forgive us and you cleanse us from unrighteousness. You can cleanse us. You can lift right out of our spirit, soul, and body the sense of shame and guilt, the sense of condemnation. Lord Jesus, would you do that for each one of us now? Those who have been carrying these things, would you come and would you lift these things right out? cleansing us, purifying us from the inside out. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful. We love you, we bless you, and we worship you. And just like you say here in your word, we proclaim your death until you come as we drink now. And we look forward to that day that you come again. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's drink together. Salvation's road with fear and 
I'm so glad you've chosen to take this time to invest in your relationship with God. I encourage you, as you go about your day today, reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What difference is it, is it making in your life? What difference does it need to make or could it make in your life? Well, I'd like to bless us, bless you as we go. We often have a practice of holding our hands out like this as a, as a physical way of saying, Jesus, I want your blessing. Would you bring it on? The blessing today comes from Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. And it reads this way. I bless you with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all who want it say... Amen. Have a great day of remembrance.